what is wrong with me? Why would I bother doing a video on hi-fi cables? Oh, caught me in a private moment. My name's Taron. Welcome to a British audio file. For some reason, nothing gets audio files more worked up than talking about cables. So a little disclaimer before we start. If you're one of those audiophiles that believes that cables have no influence on how your system sounds, save yourself your blood pressure and I urge you not to watch this video. Similarly, if you're one of those audiophiles that thinks that cables make all the difference in the world, you're probably better off not watching this video. Anybody left? Well, if you're interested in the science and the engineering that goes into these cables and you want to know my own subjective opinion on how they sound, let's carry on. I'll let you into a bit of a secret. Reviewing hi-fi equipment is not as easy as you might imagine. Take these Bukar S400s behind me. Now it might seem to some people all I need to do is hook that up into my system, listen to them for a couple of weeks and then relay what I think back to you, review over. Well, it's a little bit more involved than that. In order to distill the character of that speaker, I need to try it with different amplifiers and ideally in different rooms where the acoustics are different as well. Now it's been hooked up to my Hegel H160 for the last few weeks. It's currently hooked up to my exposure preamplifier and monoblocks, and it will be hooked up to my audio lab, which is a relatively compact 40 watt power amplifier as well. Each of those speaker amplifier combinations will reveal different characteristics in this speaker. And it's once I've done that, that I can kind of confidently say, well, this is what I think, this is the characteristics of these speakers are, and provide you guys with reliable information as to how it may behave in your setup. Now that's reviewing speakers where the difference between one speaker and another are seldomly subtle. When it comes to reviewing cables, you're talking about much subtler differences and the results are a lot more system dependent. That's why reviewing cables can be really tricky. Now I'm gonna get into the science and engineering and the reasons why that is the case. But for those of you who aren't interested and just wanna hear my subjective opinion on what different cables sound like. Um, I'm going to put a time stamp somewhere here along the bottom and you can move on to that bit. There are three electrical parameters that we need to be aware of when we're describing how well engineered a cable is. That is its DC resistance, its inductance and its capacitance. Now when we're talking about audio cables by far the most significant is DC resistance. DC resistance describes the behavior of a material in terms of how it opposes the flow of current. The higher the resistance, the more opposition there is to the flow of current. Now the DC resistance for any conductor, and we're normally considering copper as the conductor here, relates to the thickness or the cross-sectional area of that conductor. For interconnects, you'll typically have conductors which are a minimum thickness of 28 gauge, maybe up to 24 gauge. As the numbers go down, the gauge gets thicker. Speaker cables, you'd need a minimum gauge of 13, somewhere up to 11, you might get away with 10 gauge at a push um, in order to have the right kind of DC resistance. If it's too thin, the DC resistance goes up. And if it's too thick, you come into other problems like skin effect, which we'll get into later. DC resistance is not frequency dependent. If you've got too much DC resistance in your cable, you're gonna suffer signal loss across all frequencies. However, capacitance and inductance are frequency dependent. There are ways in which energy is stored within an electrical circuit. In this case, we're talking about energy stored within a cable. So let's talk about inductance first. Inductance is energy stored in a magnetic field. If you've got electricity passing through a wire, it will have an electrical field. And by association, it has to also have a magnetic field. The amount of energy that is stored in that magnetic field is the inductance of that particular material. Now, 
that opposes the flow of current and as the frequency increases the inductance increases that's why you can basically take a piece of wire and by coiling it you increase the magnetic coupling which increases the inductance and that is effectively a coil that's used as an inductor in the crossover of your speaker and essentially it's used as a low pass filter because it's better at passing low frequency uh, signal than it is a higher frequency signal. Capacitance is again a property of a circuit to store energy. In this case we're talking about stored energy as an electrical charge. So if you're talking about the capacitance of a cable it's the ability of that cable to hold an electrical charge. And the same way that inductance results in a reluctance for a circuit to change its current, capacitance results in a reluctance in a circuit to change its voltage. These are both frequency dependent effects. So capacitance as the frequency increases of a circuit, capacitance goes down. That's why essentially you can use a capacitor as a low pass filter on your crossover of a speaker to allow the higher frequencies to go to the tweeter. And you can effectively build a very simple uh, capacitor. And to show you, all you need is two conductors sandwiched in between with an insulator. If you apply a wire at this end and a wire on that end to complete a circuit, this plate effectively will hold one charge whilst the opposite wall plate will hold the opposing charge and that's essentially a capacitor. So why is this important? Well, if you've got too much inductance in your cable, you're gonna suffer losses at high frequencies. And technically speaking, if you've got too much capacitance in your uh, cable, you may suffer losses at low frequencies. And the reason I say technically is that for the kind of runs that you do in audio applications, not talking about kilometers where you're looking at telecoms industry, capacitance is not really an issue. Another form of signal loss that I think is worth mentioning is skin effect. So what is skin effect? Well, low frequencies tend to travel through the center of a conductor and the higher frequencies tend to travel around the outside. In audio applications, we're talking about alternating currents passing through wires. What alternating currents result in is changing magnetic fields. Those magnetic fields induce eddy currents that oppose the flow of the signal. That results in the impedance. Now the impedance of the circuit is a combination of its capacitance, its inductance and its resistance. So as the frequency of the signal increases, the impedance increases, resulting in signal loss at higher frequencies. This is typically associated with frequencies above the audio spectrum, so above 20 thousand hertz but in some cables it's been shown to exhibit itself at a thousand hertz which is certainly within the audible band so it's best to probably keep speaker cables at a minimum diameter of say 14 gauge so that you've got uh, enough low enough dc resistance and a maximum gauge of 10 so you're not going thicker than 10 gauge because the skin effect gets worse as the thickness of the cable increases. One of the key aspects of any cable design is the conductor itself. And generally we're talking about copper here as the conductor, although there are different materials used. Now there's differences in the grade of copper. The first kind of level or grade that you're likely to come across is tough pitch copper, which is TPC. Sometimes it can be branded as oxygen free copper because TPC has an impurity level of approximately three to 500 parts per million. So you could have a TPC copper that is 99.95% pure and branded as oxygen free copper. The next grade is linear crystal oxygen free copper or LCOFC for short, that's short. Um, 
Now that's a process that was patented by Hitachi in the 1970s where after the copper was extruded from the mold it was reheated and what that does that process is called annealing and what that does is it effectively increases the length of the crystals from say four centimeters to 13 centimeters and uh, essentially by having less crystal boundaries the impurity level drops quite dramatically from hundreds to maybe 10 or 20 uh, parts per million uh, so it's certainly purer than the TPC copper we spoke about earlier. The highest grade of copper that you're likely to come across is OCC copper. That's copper produced using the Oni continuous cast method. That was a method devised by Professor Oni of Japan in 1986. And what it involves is heating the mold when the copper is extruded and effectively it produces one continuous crystal. Crystal lengths can be anything up to hundreds of meters. And essentially it removes for all intents and purposes, all impurities due to the lack of crystal boundaries. High end cable manufacturers claim that by using higher grade copper, they achieve better sound quality. They claim that the impurities interfere with the signal flow. Now it's important to note that this is not by, backed up by scientific data. If you look at the measured performance of all these grades of copper in audio frequencies over the lengths that we're talking about in home applications, there's no difference in the measured performance. So whether you believe their claims comes down to a mixture of faith and your own personal experience. There are other conductors used in audio cables, for example, silver plated cables. Now they have a reputation of having a brighter sound. You'll also come across carbon uh, conductors, which are claimed by some manufacturers to have a much more neutral sound. And for people who want to take things to the highest possible level, there are pure silver conductors as well. Now, the benefit that silver has over copper is that it has a lower DC resistance. But bearing in mind, if you're looking at pure silver conductors, because the cost of silver being so much higher than it is of copper, quite often you're looking at conductors that are a lot thinner. So the benefit of having a pure silver conductor is negated by the fact that the conductor is a lot thinner than it would be if it was in a copper conductor. If you're going to have get thick silver conductors of the same uh, gauge as copper is going to be highly expensive. The construction or geometry of a cable can also be an important factor in terms of determining some of the characteristics of a cable. Now if we look at this cable from the cord company this is a classic figure of eight type of construction where you have one conductor running in parallel to another. These type of cables typically have a higher inductance than say a twisted type of configuration and as a result can sound a little rolled off at high frequencies. This particular cable isn't rolled off, it's silver plated, if anything is a little bit bright but I'm talking about pure copper type of constructions. This cable from AudioQuest has a twisted type of configuration. These type of cables typically have a lower inductance and a higher capacitance than the figure of eight type of cables. As a result, they don't have that problem with rolled off high frequencies. Now, as I mentioned earlier, capacitance in the audio frequency range and the lengths we're talking about, which is a maximum maybe of 10 or 15 meters, isn't so much of an issue. One of the other benefits of these cables are that by this twisted configuration, they have a lack of magnetic coupling and that has some noise rejection properties, which is another benefit. Some amplifiers now, mainly talking about older amplifiers from the likes of name and exposure, but it may apply to some modern amplifiers as well, prefer the figure of eight higher inductance type of cables. And the reason is that in the sake of purity, they have a lack of inductance networks on their output stage. And as a result, they rely on the speaker 
cable to provide the right type of inductance loading. So with those type of amplifiers, you need to run a minimum length of three and a half, four meters of this um, figure of eight type of cable so that they're happy, they have the right type of inductance loading on their output stage and um, they behave as they should. With some of these twisted configuration cables, um, they can become unstable and potentially oscillate. The insulator around a conductor has more bearing on the electrical properties of a cable than you may realise. And this is really about the dielectric properties of that insulator. Dielectric is the ability of an insulator to polarise an electrical charge. So essentially what you're talking about here is how well that insulator can separate out charges. And the perfect insulator, uh, dielectric, I should say, would be vacuum and air comes pretty close, but neither of those are really practical in these kind of applications. So the characteristic uh, capacitance and inductance of a cable to a large extent is determined by this dielectric constant. Vacuum space has a perfect dielectric constant of one. Air is pretty close to that. And the lower the dielectric constant, the better the dielectric properties of the insulator are. This dielectric constant also has a bearing on one other parameter that's very significant when you're assessing the performance of a cable. And that is the speed at which the signal travels through the cable. This is called the velocity of propagation. Now it's compared to the speed of light as it passes through a vacuum. So if a signal, this is not possible by the way, but if a signal could pass through a cable at the speed of light in a vacuum, the velocity of propagation would be 100%. So in summary, the dielectric constant of a insulator is pretty important in determining some key aspects in the performance of a cable. It defines the characteristic impedance, it defines the characteristic capacitance, and it defines the velocity of propagation, the speed at which the signal passes through the conductor. Now you'll have to forgive me, I don't remember all the uh, common dielectrics off the top of my head, so I'll scribble them down here. So the cheapest dielectrics that you're likely to come across are PVC, that has a dielectric constant of five, and the velocity of propagation is around 55%. A better dielectric uh, would be polyethylene, that's commonly used PE for short, that has a dielectric constant of 2.5 and a velocity of propagation of 65%. Better still is PTFE, commonly known as Teflon, and that's used in some high-end cable designs. That has a dielectric constant of 2.1 and a velocity of propagation of 70%. Now the fanciest designs will use an aerated kind of foam version of PTFE where they're trying to kind of inject more air uh, inside the density of that PTFE and they can get the dielectric down to about 1.3 and a velocity of propagation of 80%. Now again, these things sound really impressive but in terms of the measured performance of audio signals over the short runs that we're talking about, two, three, four, five meters maybe for interconnects, similar for speaker runs, maybe at a push 10, 15 meters, there is no uh, scientific research to corroborate that it makes any difference in terms of the measured performance of uh, an audio signal. So again, comes down to whether you believe this works, whether it's a matter of faith or your own experience. Shielding normally involves wrapping a metal foil around the dielectric. So you've got the central conductor, dielectric wrapped around the conductor, a shield wrapped around that, and then the outer jacket, which may or may not be braided. Now, the downside of shielding is that effectively you'll put a second conductor with an insulator in between 
um, and that increases the capacitance of the cable. The benefit of shielding is that it is there to prevent uh, radio frequencies and electromagnetic interference entering into the cable, which could add noise. Now, the research generally bears out that over relatively short runs that we're looking at the amount of RF and EMI uh, induced noise is not that significant. So shielding isn't always considered absolutely necessary, but is quite prudent perhaps to do in interconnects. Shielding speaker cables is generally not considered to be beneficial and in fact can be detrimental to sound quality. And the reason is that the added capacitance can be a bit of an issue. Stray magnetic and electric fields are not particularly a concern when it comes to speaker cables. And the reason is that your speaker cable is being driven by the low impedance of your uh, output of your amplifier into a low impedance load of your speaker. And uh, stray magnetic and electric fields in this low impedance uh, environment have little to no impact. There are three common ways to terminate a cable, be it soldered, crimped, or cold welded. Now there's no evidence to suggest that one method has a distinct benefit over another. And I personally tend to go for the crimped or cold welded option wherever possible, because why introduce another metal in the scenario if you don't have to? What is important is that they form a solid contact. Now that's also true of the connector itself. That needs to be able to have a good contact pressure with whatever you're connecting it to, whether it be a component amplifier or your speaker terminals, because DC resistance is shown to significantly increase if there isn't sufficient contact pressure. You don't need it to be ripping the terminals off, but it needs to be a good solid connection. What's also Beneficial is for the connector to have the same impedance as the um, cable, but that's rarely the case. Okay, so enough about the science and technology. What do I really think about cables? High-end cable manufacturers can demonstrate that using the linear crystal or the OCC method, they can produce a purer conductor. They can also demonstrate that by using fancier dielectrics, they can increase the velocity of propagation, the speed at which a signal passes through the cable. What they can't do is prove that at audio frequencies for the relatively short runs that we're talking about, that it has any measurable difference by having these fancier um, technologies. Radio frequencies where the transmission lengths may be hundreds of meters, perhaps even kilometers, pay, maybe, but not at audio signals. Snake oil? Well, not necessarily. Practically every speaker, amplifier, DAC, turntable engineer will tell you that they regularly change components in their designs. And there's no difference in the measurable performance, but they can detect a difference in sound quality. Now, it's true that measurements can reveal things that we can't hear, but it's arrogant to assume that we can measure everything that we can hear. Science and technology is evolving all the time. Now, it's entirely possible that high-end cable manufacturers have found ways to squeeze that little extra performance out of their cables that we can't measure today, but will possibly be able to measure in the future. In the absence of, you know, substantial double blind trials where you have the opportunity to turn people's subjective opinions into objective facts, I think it's just a case of your point of view and trusting your own experience. In the end, you pay your money and take your choice. Well, what's my personal experience? For what it's worth, here's my two pennies worth. Now, different cables sound different, and I'm sorry if you don't agree with me, but that's my own personal experience based on listening to many different systems 
over many different years and having lots of different cables come in and out. So what do I have here? Well, I have this um, freebie that you get with components and that sounds pretty awful on everything, very dull and lifeless. I have a relatively inexpensive cable that I purchased off Amazon. Uh, I think it was 10 or 15 pounds and that sounds a little bit better but the high frequencies are pretty grainy and there's probably genuine reasons when you look at probably the design and construction of it I'm sure. I've got here a monster cable that is 20-25 years old. It's a solid copper conductor screened with good quality termination and connectors and that sounds pretty good. In fact, in every system, fairly neutral, uh, consistent performance across a bunch of systems. I've got Van der Hull II and Van der Hull I. This is the first that I have here, and this is a solid carbon construction. It's pretty smooth, a um, bit more detailed than the uh, monster cable that I spoke about earlier. And depending on the system, can sound really good. Um, in my audio lab setup, I prefer the Van der Hulls. In uh, my exposure, I prefer uh, cord cables, which I'll speak about in a second. I've got here a XLR or a pseudo XLR connection. This was given to me by John Farlow, the designer um, of um, exposure amplifiers. Um, so he gave that to me. That's inexpensive. It's um, well shielded copper cable with decent termination, decent quality connectors, and it sounds pretty good, pretty similar to the a, um, to the monster cable I spoke about earlier. And behind me, I have my cord signature cables. They retail for about 800 pounds, so they're pretty expensive. I have two, one runs from my DAC to my preamp, another one from my preamp to my power amp, and they are certainly the most revealing and detailed. Uh, I quite like them on the exposure setup because the exposures tend to be a little rolled off at the top end. However, with my Audio Lab rig, they tend to be a little bit bright and I prefer the Van der Hulls. Now, I wouldn't go out today and spend 800 pounds on interconnects and there's very few people I'd suggest do that either. Don't get me wrong, if you've got eight, 10,000 pound rig that's perfectly set up and you've got the best out of your speakers, amplifiers and source components, by all means, go out, fill your boots. But for the rest of us, you're better off spending your money on upgrading your source components, your amplifiers and your speakers. The reason is the law of diminishing returns kicks in much quicker with cables than it does with source components, amplifiers and speakers. Now, I normally advocate a three times rule when you're upgrading components. So to illustrate, if you've got a pair of speakers, let's say ELAC debuts, which are about £250, I would suggest that you spend three times that money to get a noticeable improvement in sound quality to get a return on your investment where you think it was worthwhile spending that extra money. So don't go and upgrade your £250 speakers for a 500 pound pair of um, ELAC Uniqs jump a level above that to something like the KEF LS50, which are seven, 800 pounds, and you'll see a noticeable improvement. Those improvements are much less noticeable when it comes to cables. So what are my recommendations? For the vast majority of people, I would stick to solid copper interconnects and speaker cables and the reason is that solid copper tends to be very consistent in terms of how it performs from system to system and also tends to have quite a neutral sound characteristic. So for most people out there who are looking for an interconnect, a good quality interconnect, if you look at cables made by Mogami, Belden, Van Dam with good quality termination and connectors, you can pick those up for about 50 pounds. Speaker cables, the gauge is very important. You want a minimum gauge in terms of the cross-sectional area of 14 gauge, and you don't really want to go anywhere bigger than 10 gauge. 
and again solid copper conductors and you can pick those up for probably five to ten pounds a meter so they're not expensive once you've got those in place you know you've got good quality speaker cables you've got good quality interconnects worry about the rest of your hi-fi getting that up to a standard that you're very comfortable with and then eventually once you've taken that as far as you possibly can you can go back and revisit cables and see if it's worthwhile spending a lot more money to try and squeeze out a little more performance. So I think that's pretty much it in terms of what I wanted to cover. Hopefully gain something from this video and haven't offended too many people. Um, if you like this video please hit that like button um, please share this video and if you like my approach to hi-fi and you haven't subscribed already please think about subscribing it really does help this channel out in terms of widening its uh, reach and um, appeal so for today for now a British audiophile signing off